For the longest time, and in many ways it still is, wrestling was one of those industries built on a rigid and unwritten series of social traditions. Respect given and earned through ritual, whether it's shaking the hands of everyone in the room as soon as you arrive at a show, undercarders helping to put up and take down a ring, all the way to enduring the ribs or pranks of the veterans. And hey, pranks are fine. Then Justin Roberts having his passport stolen and not given back to him so that he missed a flight. That's, that's not really a prank. That's just you being a dick. Until a wind of change blew through WWE in the 2010s and we'll get to that. Hazing of newer talent by veterans went unpunished in the company and hey, to be honest, I wouldn't want to police a bunch of testosterone giants hopped up on adrenaline and compensating for professional frustrations by clinging to their last vestiges of social clout either, which makes it all the sad that I took it till they liked me is how most hazing stories end. Most, but not all. I'm Adam Hailing from Parts of Unknown and here are 10 WWE wrestlers who fought back against hazing. And just before we kick into the list, please subscribe to Parts of Unknown. Some people who watch our stuff watch it but don't subscribe and that's fine in a way. But also, if you do subscribe and help us add the numbers to the current number, the big numbers means we can get money and make content for the numbers. Number 10, Brock Lesnar. Jesus Christ, why would anyone want to haze a 280 pound amateur wrestler that looks like the abominable snowman with alopecia? I mean, hell, Kurt Hennig tried to tussle with Brock Lesnar on a plane ride from hell, and the vanilla meat storm tussled back so hard it almost killed everyone. WWE history books are full of Brock giving back as good as he got, but so far my favorite story I found during my research was a fresh-faced Brock Lesnar being summoned to wrestler's court, and an unofficial dispensary of justice for perceived breaches of wrestling etiquette, and Brock allegedly didn't show up for his court date. When JBL tried to retrieve him, Lesnar simply responded, f**k off, and f**k off JBL did. Although when Lesnar jumped ship from WWE to the Minnesota Vikings, they managed to get a successful haze on him, taping his ankles together, dumping water on him, and having a receiver pin him with a three count. Number nine, Leo Rush. While the crueler examples of backstage hazing have widely diminished in the internet age, there's still expectations of newer talent to act subservient, an issue recently brought to light by Leo Rush, who was having none of it. Last year, Rush took to Twitter to share an email he privately sent to WWE management in November 2018, which was around the time he was working as Bobby Lashley's mouthpiece, detailing how an unnamed WWE colleague took him to one side and told him how it was expected for new talent to buy beers for veterans, carry coolers off the tour bus, and even carry some of the older guys' bags for them, to which Rush responded, um, no. That's not my job, which in his own words, led to a severe amount of heat backstage with other wrestlers spreading damaging lies about him and his attitude behind his back. Just an example of how even in the modern era, people may not be shitting in each other's food anymore, but failure to know your role can still hold talent down. Number eight, Palmer Cannon. Ah yes, the first of what will be many entries about how JBL is not a nice man shots fired. Palmer Cannon was an on-screen authority figure in the mid 2000s who much like the right to censor before him, was an on-screen parody of meddling network execs championing for political correctness gone mad. Palmer Cannon's initials were PC. Get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? However, Palmer Cannon's WWE career would come to an immediate end in April 2006 when he walked away from a WWE tour in Italy, flying himself home and demanding his release from the company. The reason for this? Chris Benoit, JBL, and their constant wrestlers caught bullshit, including allegedly duct taping him, throwing him in the showers, and threatening to sexually assault him. And yet, turns out you don't need to work for a company that allows that kind of thing to happen backstage. And while it's sad to see anyone being driven out of a company in that way, fair play to Cannon for deciding that a decent wage wasn't worth that kind of bullshit. Number seven, Bubba Ray Dudley. Another example of wrestling not being real until someone decides to make it real, by far the most common form of hazing in WWE was having veterans wrestle newcomers stiff, striking and grappling them harder than they otherwise would in order to gauge that newcomer's toughness. Because yes, a good way to test someone's wrestling ability is for Bob Holly to chop them in the throat and see what happens. In an interview, Bubba Ray Dudley looked back on a time where JBL put him through his paces. According to Bubba, Vince had taken Bradshaw to one side and instructed him to quote, beat the shit out of this kid, which to be fair is exactly what Ollie Davis told Luke to do to me when I first started at WrestleTalk. According to Bubba, JBL started punching him full in the face for real, so the ECW alumnus returned fire and started painting the Texan with stiff shots of his own. After the match, Bradshaw said to Vince of the Dudleys, these kids are gonna be alright, and that's equal parts heartwarming and downright psychotic. Number six, Ken Shamrock. Why would you haze him? L look at him. Look at him. He looks like eight wolves. He looks like if neck veins gain sentience. He looks like if Robert De Niro and David Hasselhoff had a baby and that baby grew up
grew up in the wilds of Siberia. This incident happened during Shamrock's time in WWE, but actually dated back to 1990 in South Atlantic Pro Wrestling, a Carolinas-based promotion. The Nasty Boys, who are about to leave the promotion for WWE, were in a club with a few guys, including Shamrock, one of Shamrock's friends, and that friend's girlfriend, whom the Nasty Boys repeatedly, drunkenly grabbed at, despite Shamrock's warnings not to. Later that night, an irate Shamrock stormed the Nasty Boys' hotel room when Sags hit him from behind with a metal plate underneath a telephone before beating the hell out of him and nearly throwing him over a balcony. Nasty boys, you're twats. And so the story went for years that Jerry Sags had beaten up Ken Shamrock until one fateful day in 1998 when all three men ran into each other at an airport. WWE guys began to rib Shamrock about the fight and he flipped out, challenging the Nasty Boys to a rematch which both men politely declined before hightailing it. Number five, Scott Hall. Spoiler alert, the moral of this story is don't mess with Scott Hall. This story dates back to before Scott's time as Razor Ramon, back when he was working in the AWA in the late 80s. The details of the incident are that Marty Dunetti, who was riding high in the AWA as part of the Rockers, checked into a hotel with a friend for the night before proceeding to trash their room. The only problem was, the name they'd given at hotel check-in was Scott Halls. The hotel then proceeded to call the AWA to complain when Scott Hall got wind of what actually happened. He approached the AWA's booker, Bob Brown, to ask permission to enact brutal revenge on Dunetti, which was given. Scott Hall proceeded to the locker room where he found Ginetti sleeping and consciousness being no object, rained down upon him with great vengeance and furious anger. Since he's only been there for six months, Hall expected to be fired for the outburst, but was simply told, hey, next time, do it after the show, because now Marty can't work. Oh, wrestling, you're f***ing terrifying all of the time. Number four, Steve Blackman. And now begins a trilogy of entries that I like to call JBL f***s around and JBL finds out. So Bradshaw really enjoyed his role as unofficial policeman in the Fed, prosecuting whenever wrestlers committed faux pas, breaking in new talent in the ring and checks notes, feeling up new talent in the showers. Well, I guess that's tough. Sorry, I guess I don't really understand tough guys. Bob Holly detailed a story in his book about how JBL's little habit of goosing his workmates almost cost him big time when he tried it against the lethal weapon Steve Blackman, the toughest man to ever walk around with a block of cheese on his head. At an airport, a drunk JBL repeatedly patted Blackman on the bottom, to which Steve responded, and I'm paraphrasing here, kindly refrain, lest you encourage bad news. A few more pats later, Later, Blackman repeatedly popped JBL in the face until they were broken up, with Steve threatening to kill JBL and only being placated by JBL apologizing to him in front of the entire locker room. Number three, the Blue World Order. Who run the world? Blue. Look, I haven't told this story in a while, so just leave me alone. One Night Stand 2005, and during the closing WWE versus ECW brawl, an intoxicated JBL repeatedly punched the Blue Meanie for real because JBL is repeatedly a tool for real. It's generally one of the most egregious and public showcases of someone violently big leaguing a talent because they aren't from round here, but oh boy did they make Bradders pay for it. Less than a month later, on the 7th of July 2005 episode of Smackdown, which by the way was also the episode featuring the terrorist angle that got Mohamed Hassan unceremoniously sacked, so an all-round great episode of telly. Featured on the card was a no-DQ match pitting Meany against Jables, which saw Stevie Richards avenge Bradshaw's hazing by cracking him with one of the hardest chair shots we'd ever seen, dealing JBL a whopper concussion and like, are we supposed supposed to see that as a Yas Queen moment? Because dude's getting a disciplinary head injury on public telly. It's just like, get an HR department that works, WWE, for f sake. Number two, Joey Styles. All right, this one's a pretty feel-good moment. Joey Styles, acclaimed ECW branded throat destroyer, enthusiastic exclaimer, and the father of AJ Styles, knocked down JBL with a single punch. During WWE's visit to Iraq in 2008 for that year's tribute to the troops, JBL reportedly spent much of the tour off his ass drunk and making Joey Styles' life a living hell. During the plane ride home from Iraq, JBL poured a bucket of ice over a sleeping Lillian Garcia, it being another unwritten rule of wrestling etiquette that falling asleep on a plane may you fair game. This, combined with Days of Torment, saw JBL and Styles get into a shouting match with wrestlers rushing to pull them apart. When Bradshaw broke free and rushed Styles, Joey struck him down with a single punch, which is a George McFly finally taking down Biff kind of movie moment that makes you wipe away a tear. Apparently, Styles gave JBL a black eye that was so visible that on the next episode of Raw, the 2008 Slammies, JBL wore his hat super low to keep the eye in shadow. And number one, Luchasaurus. Yes, despite having a Jurassic gimmick, Luchasaurus has no time for outdated, air quotes, traditional hazing bullshit. Although he wasn't Luchasaurus at the time, instead he'd been going by the name Judas Devlin in NXT. Devlin was released from NXT in 2014 after an injury, and a few months later, in early 2015, took it upon himself to blow the whistle on then NXT head trainer Bill DeMott's brand of army boot camp break him to make him style of training. The man currently part of the Jurassic Express, shared to 
Reddit an email he'd previously sent to WWE's HR detailing just some of DeMott's horrendous treatment of young talent, including dangerous drills, grabbing an injured Dax Harwood by his neck, ripping a shirt off the superstar then known as Rusev while he was recovering from neck surgery, and much more. The post led to a number of other talent coming out with their tales of performance center cruelty, including EC3 tweeting, a heart can stretch me any day, and know nothing dips slapping me when I'm concussed is different. Amidst a scandal, DeMott stepped down as head trainer, and this could be seen as the symbolic end of the old school ritual of hazing, of mean-spirited violence and torment, dressed up as rites of passage, although how much still goes on behind the scenes is anyone's guess, because wrestling is super weird. It is super weird weird. And that's our list. Have we missed any famous examples of wrestlers fighting back against hazing? Let us know below and don't forget to like and share this video if you enjoyed it. And make sure you're subscribed to Parts of Unknown for more silly wrestling content. Jam that jam.